Hello students, as we continue our journey exploring some basic concepts in human physiology, we want to look at the issue of body water and body fluid compartments. Now as usual, I provide you with a list of learning objectives at the start of the lecture. This will allow you to review the material and ensure that you can answer all or explain all of these learning objectives uh, at the end of the session. So for example, if you look at learning objective number three, understand the principle used in the measurement of the fluid compartments. You should be able to identify that principle, explain its princi the principle, and how it is used to measure fluid compartments at the end of this lecture. So these um, learning objectives, as always, are there for your reference, and you can always double check with them at the end of your study period. So let's start with some basic introductory statements. Um, I think we're well aware that water is the most abundant component of the human body. Actually, approximately 60% of total body weight is actually water. Uh, that's why dehydration could have such a significant effect upon you. And we're going to talk about that a little later in today's lecture. Several factors affect the water content of the body. And some of these would include your hydration status. I just mentioned dehydration. Uh, your age, the water content of your body does change with age. And also the proportion of water in your body is affected by the amount of adipose tissue or fat cells. Because if you remember from your histology, uh, the majority of a fat cell is made up of this fat globule and not so much cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is water-based, whereas, of course, the fat globule is triglyceride-based. So if we just explore this a little bit more, um, infants, uh, young babies, uh, they don't have a lot of body fat and they don't have a lot of bone mass. And so they are actually made up primarily of uh, uh, typical cells and they're approximately 73% or more of water. Very important to recognize that. That's again why infants are susceptible to dehydration and why children can die from dehydrating illnesses much more easily than adults. The total water content of a human being will tend to decline throughout life. But for a healthy male, about 60% of your body weight is body water. And for a healthy female, it's about 50%. The difference between the male and female uh, tend to reflect that females tend to have more fat accumulated around the hips uh, and they also have a lower proportion of skeletal mu muscle. Obviously, um, those are general terms, general terms. It might not be the case for any one individual. And finally, by the time you get to the older stages of life later in, on in life, you have about 45% of your body weight is water. So this diagram just summarizes everything that we said, uh, just looking at the body water uh, in males, in females, and in infants. So how is this water divided up within the body? Uh, we call that body fluid compartments. Where is this water found in the body? So total body water is distributed between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. So those are terms that you will become very, very familiar with. The intracellular fluid simply refers to the fluid found within the cell and the extracellular fluid refers to all the different types of fluid found on the outside of the cell. So one of the first questions we can ask ourselves is what structure separates the intracellular fluid from the extracellular fluid? I'll give you a moment to think about that. The answer is the cell membrane. And in our next lecture, we'll be exploring the structure of the cell membrane 
and seeing why the cell membrane is such an important structure in the human body and how it's been uh, shaped and designed to perform those functions. So you can see on the diagram there on the right that total body water is divided between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid and approximately 40% uh, of body weight or three-fifths of total body water uh, is found in the intracellular component whereas 20% uh, of body weight or a quarter to a third is found in the extracellular fluid component. And again, this diagram here just uh, emphasizes what I just told you, but it shows you that the extracellular fluid compartment is divided into two as well. It's divided into something called the interstitial fluid, which is a fluid that surrounds the tissues, and the plasma, which is a fluid component of the blood. So you can then say that the total body water is found in the intracellular fluid, the interstitial fluid, and the plasma. And collectively, these three compartments make up approximately 99% of all body water. There is a small amount of fluid found in certain structures like the spinal cord, uh, parts of the eye, uh, the joints. Uh, this fluid makes up what is known as the transcellular fluid, but that's only responsible for a little under 1% of total body water. So just putting a few figures uh, to do these things. So the intracellular fluid is usually two thirds to three quarters of total body weight. Uh, that's 0.4 times 70 of a 20 kilogram man. And that gives you, sorry, sorry, let me correct myself. The intracellular fluid is approximately two thirds of total body water. So if total body water is 60% of the weight of a human, that intracellular fluid is 0.4 times the total weight of the human. 0.4 times 70 gives 28 kilograms. Um, the extracellular fluid is one third of total body water, which will then equate to 0.2 times 70 for a 70 kilogram man, which gives you 14 kilograms. And the extracellular fluid is divided into the plasma and the interstitial fluid. The structure that separates these two compartments would, of course, be the capillary walls of the blood vessels. And in the extracellular fluid, the majority, approximately 80% or four-fifths, uh, is the interstitial fluid, and one-fifth is the plasma. So all of these things are summarized in these diagrams. These concepts are not difficult, but you just have to take the time to learn them and understand them. So the next question we want to ask ourselves is, well, how, how did we discover these volumes? How did we come up with them? And the answer is based on a very basic principle of chemistry, which is the concentration of a substance is equal to the amount of the substance over the volume of distribution. Let me repeat that. The concentration of a substance is equal to the amount of the substance once it is well mixed throughout the compartment over the volume of distribution. So we make use of this basic equation in something called the indicator dilution principle. Essentially, you take a known volume of a substance and you introduce it into a compartment and you allow that substance to mix within the compartment. And then after a while, you measure the concentration of the substance in the compartment. Now you'll see here, you now have two components of your equation. You know how much you injected, and you now have the concentration. And based upon that, you can now easily calculate the volume of distribution. 
And so we use this indicator dilution principle to calculate the volume of distribution for the various body fluid compartments. Now, if we're going to do that, these substances that we inject must have certain characteristics. One, we must be able to measure them. Two, we have to ensure that when we inject a substance in a compartment, it stays within that compartment or else our concentration measurement is of no use to us. Uh, it could diffuse into other compartments. It could be metabolized. Uh, all of these things we have to ensure do not take place if we want our readings to be accurate. We also have to ensure that the substance we use uh, does not introduce an osmotic gradient that pulls water into the compartment and therefore changes the volume. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we have to ensure that we're doing no harm and the substance that we're using is non-toxic and in no way uh, is deleterious to the human being or the animal in which we're working. Based upon these characteristics, several substances have been identified that can measure uh, different body compartments. If we want to measure total body water, we can use heavy water, uh, deuterated water, tritiated water, or we can also use the compound antipyrine. Uh, this distributes throughout the entire body uh, and we can then calculate total body water. If we want to just measure the extracellular fluid volume, uh, substances that have been typically used are sucrose and mannitol, which don't cross into any other compartments. If we want to measure just a plasma volume, we can inject radio labeled albumin, that's a protein, or the substance Evans Blue dye, which actually binds the albumin. And those substances can be used. And so we can see that researchers and scientists have identified several substances that can be introduced and used to measure. Uh, these body fluid compartments. Now you would have realized that there are a couple of fluid compartments that we cannot measure by using this principle. So for example, you cannot measure the intracellular fluid volume or you cannot measure the interstitial fluid volume. The first one you cannot measure because you can't get a substance into all the millions of cells in the body. And the second one you cannot measure because you can't get a substance to just stay within the interstitial fluid. And therefore, the way we utilize or the method we use to measure these volumes is by subtraction. So, for example, if you know total body water and you also know the extracellular fluid volume, then using a measurement, you can calculate the intracellular fluid volume. And similarly, we can do uh, similar calculations for the interstitial fluid volume. So this diagram here just simply summarizes all that we've said about uh, body fluid compartments and about the different compounds that are used to measure different uh, compartments within the body. Now, the other important thing to appreciate about body fluid compartments, and we're going to study this in more detail when we start to look at the electrical properties of cells, is that these body fluid compartments have substances in them. And a major substance that's found within all of these fluid compartments are ions, charged chemical substances. But the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid have slightly different uh, chemical compositions. And you are expected to know the chemical compositions of the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. This diagram here summarizes the electrolyte composition of different body fluids, particularly the plasma, the interstitial fluid. Now, these are the extracellular fluid compartments and the intracellular fluid compartments. And as you are in medicine and the allied health professions, uh, this is something that you just have to learn. Uh, the advent of uh, smartphones and all of these electronic devices means that this information is at our fingertips. But I, ad I encourage you and I advise you to take the time to, to learn the concentrations of the major anions and cations like sodium and potassium and bicarbonate and chloride, uh, because it'll be very, very important for you as you go forward in your career. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about something called Starling's forces. These are the forces that act upon body water as it moves through the capillaries of the body. 
Now, the capillary system of the body or the cardiovascular system of the body consists of an arterial system that moves blood away from the heart and a venous system that moves blood towards the heart. And the capillaries are the very small blood vessels that link the arterial system to the venous system. And most of the interstitial fluid in the body, the fluid that surrounds the tissues, arises as blood flows through the capillaries and blood is forced out through the very porous walls of the capillaries. And the Starling's forces refer to the forces that act upon the fluid in the capillaries. These are the Starling's forces. And there are two Starling's forces that we need to think about. There's the hydrostatic pressure and there's the oncotic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of the pumping action of the heart that pushes blood out of the capillaries. The oncotic pressure is the osmotic oncotic pressure of non-diffusible proteins that causes water to flow with it. Now once you understand that, we can identify four uh, forces that act upon fluid as it moves through the capillaries. Capillaries. The first is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. This is generated by the pumping action of the heart and this tends to force uh, fluid out of the capillaries. The second is the osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. The fluid surrounding the tissues has an osmotic pressure and that tends to draw fluid out of the capillaries and into the interstitium. So we have two forces here, the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries and the osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid pulling or pushing water out of the capillary. But at the same time, the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium, because the interstitium itself also has a hydrostatic pressure, pushes fluid back into the capillaries and the osmotic or oncotic pressure of the proteins in the capillaries pulls fluid back into the capillaries. So all in all, you see you have four forces. Two are pushing water out of the capillaries and two are pulling the water back into the capillaries. And the composition of these forces creates the perfect balance of the amount of fluid in the capillaries and the amount of fluid in the interstitium. When something goes wrong with any one of these forces, it often can lead to a buildup of fluid or an accumulation of fluid in the interstitium, and we call that edema. And so this diagram here shows you how those forces change as you move from the arterial end of the capillary to the venous end of the capillary. You can see on this diagram here, at the arterial end of the capillary, right there, that the hydrostatic pressure pushing water out of the capillary is at its highest, right there. But as you move down the length of the capillary, the hydrostatic pressure gets less, and therefore the overall effect is that there's a reduction in the amount of fluid leaving the capillary as it moves from the arterial end to the venous end.
Now, as I told you, edema is the accumulation of fluid within the interstitium, and it can appear as swollen extremities like swollen feet, but you can also have edema accumulating around the abdomen or in the lungs where it can be very dangerous. So the definition of edema is the accumulation of excess fluid in the interstitial spaces, and it's usually from an alteration in the Starling's forces. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. Just by way of reference, what you're seeing in that image there is something called pitting edema, which is usually found in cardiovascular conditions of congestive heart failure. Fluid has accumulated in the extremities, and if you press on it, it leaves a little indentation in the tissue. That's why it's called pitting edema. So when there is a increases in hydrostatic pressure, you get accumulation of fluid in the extremities, and you can have increases in hydrostatic pressure due to an increase in arterial pressure. Uh, but very often these things occur because there's a blockage in the system. For example, venous stasis. Uh, that could be because of varicose veins, or it could be because of congestive heart failure, where the blood is no longer able to be pumped out by the heart, and therefore there's a back pressure flowing through the venous system. That means the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries increases tremendously, and fluid is forced out into the interstitial. Another way in which you can get fluid in the interstitium is if there are changes in the permeability of the capillary membrane. And these usually happen when there's some type of allergic reaction leading to the release of substances like histamine. Histamine greatly increases the capillary permeability. And so you can see in this little boy, he's had some sort of allergic reaction leading to swelling of the lips and the face because the permeability of his capillary membranes has increased and more fluid is now leaving the capillaries and going into the interstitium. Another way in which you can change the amount of fluid in the interstitium is if the oncotic pressure changes. The amount of proteins that help to pull substances back into the capillaries changes. So in severe cases of malnutrition like kwashiorkor, or, or in protein losing conditions like nephritis, uh, where you lose protein, the amount of proteins in the plasma decreases. You cannot pull or retain water in the plasma and therefore fluid uh, leaks into the uh, interstitium and often depicted uh, as a distended abdomen as is seen in these pictures here. And finally, uh, you can get obstruction of the lymphatic system, which drains the interstitium. All this fluid that accumulates in the interstitium is drained via the lymphatic system of the body. And if these lymphatics get blocked, uh, there, there are nematodes like filariasis that do that, or uh, malignancies that block the lymph nodes. If these get blocked, uh, you can then get edema because the interstitial fluid cannot drain. So I want you to appreciate that by understanding Starling's forces, it allows you to be able to deal with a host of medical conditions, as we've just seen in this brief review. So I want you to take the time to go over the Starling's forces, review them and understand them, and understand how you can apply them to your medical practice. Okay, so let's talk about the water steady state, the water steady state. And what we mean by the water steady state is, remember we looked at the concept of homeostasis, and basically we need to have a steady balance to allow humans to function. And therefore the water steady state says the amount of water coming into the body each day should really equal the amount of water being lost by the body every day. If not, over time, you're going to have an increase in water or decrease in water, and both of which can be dangerous to the human condition. So, how do we get most of our water? Well, the majority of our water comes from drinking, a much smaller amount comes from the food we eat, and then some is produced by metabolic processes in the body. But you can see the main things that we control that will regulate the amount of water coming into the body 
or what we eat and what we drink. And you can see on average, we're taking in about two and a half liters of water a day. Well, what are our losses? Well, the primary loss is urinary, um, and also there's some loss uh, through fecal matter. Then you have other losses uh, due to evaporation from the respiratory tract and the skin surface. And then finally through sweating and other things like that. And what should happen is you should lose approximately the same amount that you take in every day. So you can see our average losses are about 2,500 mils every day. Now, depending on environmental conditions, this can change. If you're in a very hot environment, you're going to sweat more and you can lose a lot more. If you've been exercising, you're going to sweat more and you can lose a lot more. If you have some kind of uh, condition, like you may have a diarrhea, you will lose a lot more fluid through the feces. In all of these conditions, as you lose water, it's very, very important that it gets replaced. And that's what we define as the water steady state. So dehydration is a vague term but it's basically how we describe a situation in which there's been excessive water loss. You need to know some of the clinical signs and symptoms of dehydration, and they are summarized in this table before you. So if you have mild dehydration, you'll be thirsty, there'll be a loss of appetite, your skin will be dry, your urine color will increase, and you may have some fatigue and weakness. If it gets worse, your heart rate is going to increase, your respiratory rate is going to increase. Because your dehydration is so severe, you're actually gonna have reduced urination and sweating. And this can lead to other things like extreme fatigue and muscle cramps. And at this play point, you need to be concerned. Mild dehydration is usually less than 5% body weight. Uh, moderate to severe dehydration is obviously a lot more than that. And once you move beyond 15% body weight, you're putting yourself at great danger if you're dehydrated. Now, in thinking about dehydration, remember I explained to you that in these extracellular fluid compartments, uh, you don't just have water, but you have a set of um, electrolytes. And as it pertains to the loss of water, the other important electrolyte that we need to consider is the loss of sodium, because sodium is the primary electrolyte or is the electrolyte with the greatest concentration in the extracellular fluid. So in looking to evaluate someone who has dehydration, you also need to find out how much sodium have they lost. How much sodium has they lost? Because that sodium is exerting a significant osmotic pressure. And you don't want to replace just water. You may also need to replace electrolytes and in particular sodium. So there's something called the Darrow-Yane diagram, which you can use to evaluate how fluids change uh, as water is being lost. And it's used to give a simple assessment of both volume and the osmolality status of the body. So you can see here, it's a very simple diagram. It shows the osmolality of the extracellular and the intracellular fluid, and it also shows the volume. And you can see that the ICF is about twice the size of the ECF. But very importantly, the ICF and the ECF have the same osmolality. They have the same osmolality. And that should be maintained throughout. So remember, in looking at how fluids are moving throughout the body, 
the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid change independent of each other but equilibrium always occurs so the osmolality must come back to the same so what do i mean by that you can lose fluid from the extracellular compartment independent of fluid loss in the intracellular department but over time osmolality will equilibrate such that there'll be movements of water to bring things back to to that equilibrium position so let's look at this example here let's imagine we lose fluid from the extracellular fluid compartment as you can see by that tap causing fluid to come out of the extracellular fluid compartment so you have excessive loss of water from the extra fluid compartment because you've lost water from the extracellular fluid compartment the osmotic pressure rises in the extracellular fluid compartment and now water is going to flow from the intracellular fluid compartment into the extracellular fluid compartment to balance the osmotic pressure so the principle water is first lost independently from one compartment osmotic pressure changes and then a, re, a new balance point is established so the cells lose water to the ECF by osmosis the cells shrink and this is what could be happening in some forms of the dehydration this would then be an example of what we call isoosmotic dehydration in which the concentration of the fluid lost from the ECF is the same as the concentration of the is the same as the concentration of the ECF and so you simply have a volume contraction you simply have a volume contraction there's no major changes in osmolality and this occurs when you have situations like um, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, or hemorrhaging. That's called an isoosmotic dehydration. Isoosmotic dehydration. The fluid is lost from the plasma and is then depleted from the interstitial space. No major changes occur in osmolality, and therefore there are no fluid shifts into or out of the intracellular fluid compartment. You simply have a contraction of the extracellular fluid. And that's depicted by the dotted line in the bottom diagram below. As I'm pointing out to you now. So let me repeat that. In isoosmotic dehydration, you lose fluid from the extracellular fluid compartment. That fluid has the same osmolality as the ECF and the ICF. So there's no change or no flow of fluid from the ICF into the ECF. And so the result is there's simply a volume contraction in the extracellular fluid. Now what I would like you to do is I'd like you to draw a darrow yane diagram to depict the following states of dehydration or overhydration. When you have hyperosmotic dehydration, hypoosmotic dehydration, and iso, hyper, and hypoosmotic overhydration. Now I don't want you to 
look at the rest of this PowerPoint. I don't want you to look at the rest of this PowerPoint. What I want you to do is I want you to take the time and try and work these things out. After you've taken the time and you've attempted to draw these diagrams, then I want you to look at the rest of the PowerPoint, study the PowerPoint, study the figures, and understand what has taken place. But please take a few moments just to review and to attempt to answer these questions as they pertain to these Darrow Yanni diagrams. And the other thing I want you to do is I want you to do some research and I want you to find out the conditions, the clinical conditions in which you can get these situations of dehydration and overhydration. Okay, so this is hyperosmotic dehydration. Hyperosmotic dehydration. And I want you to look at that diagram and I want you to see if you understand what's taking place in that diagram. Remember, all fluid is first lost from the extracellular fluid compartment. And what we're seeing taking place here is the fluid that is being lost is leaving behind a fluid that is more concentrated. So the fluid that is being lost doesn't have a lot of salt or electrolytes in it. And this, this happens when someone sweats a lot. Imagine someone is running a marathon and they're losing a lot of sweat. What they end up losing is they lose more water than salt. So they leave within their system a hyperosmotic ECF. Fluid then moves from the ECF, from the ICF into the ECF in an attempt to balance. And the end result is there's a volume contraction, but the solution, the fluid that's left remaining is hyperosmotic, hyperosmotic. In hyperosmotic dehydration, as you can see written, it's caused by water deficits, by decreased intake, uh, diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, uh, fever through excessive sweating and so on, when the sweat is hypotonic. And this diagram explains what's taking place. Now in this case, we have hypoosmotic dehydration. In this case, we're losing a very concentrated solution. And it means that the result is that there's a uh, 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 a very weakly concentrated solution left in the extracellular fluid. What that will do is it will now cause fluid to move from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. So fluid is shifting from the ECF into the ICF, but it's a fluid that is hypoosmotic. This does not happen often and is most associated with problems of the kidney where the kidney is losing sodium chloride. So I'm going to let you do some reading on that. And then these are the examples of overhydration. Uh, overhydration is most likely going to take place if uh, for some reason you've given too much uh, solutions via IV solutions. Uh, and it can also happen in cases where there's edema. And then clinically, uh, in some rare conditions, you can get hyperosmotic overhydration and hypoosmotic overhydration. You can look up those situations as we go forward. So I haven't taken a lot of time to explain these things yet because I want you to go and study them and uh, uh, um, get a hold of it on yourself and we'll discuss these further in class. So that brings us to the end of this lecture on body water and body fluid compartments. I hope you found it useful and I hope it gave you a better uh, appreciation of uh, the importance of water inside of your body and also a better understanding of when things go wrong uh, when you see somebody with a swollen part of the body uh, when you hear about a grandparent who has edema or when you yourself are dehydrated because you were ill with vomiting or you went and exercised and you lost too much water that you have a better idea of the things you need to be thinking about as you consider how to replenish water and how to take care of yourself as always until we meet again next time have a good day.